I've known Jules for quite a, quite a long time and Jules shares a real passion for the same kind of topics that, that, that I do and also that Rebel Wisdom has covered uh, a lot. Sort of the, the nexus between transformation, spirituality, ecstasy, and also the history of ideas. And, and in particular, sort of that, that sort of nexus of kind of religion, philosophy, spirituality. Um, so I'm really pleased that, that Jules is here. And Jules has been spending a lot of time recently, has just brought out a book about spiritual emergencies, which is another topic um, that I'm absolutely fascinated with. I have a little bit of personal experience with as well. And Jules, I'd love if, you, if you'd if you like to kind of take it away and explain your interest in this topic and um, where, where you've got with it uh, at the time of making the book. And mm -hmm. Thanks, David. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I like your background as well. People go for like the bookshelf background, but you've got, is that CDs in the background or? It is books. They're not mine, but they're, they're books. books far back. Okay. Um, so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes, just about some research that we've been doing recently, um, which uh, came out in a new book we just brought out called Breaking Open. Um, and then I'm going to put you all into breakout rooms to discuss uh, in hopefully one on one uh, breakout rooms some of the ideas that we've raised. And then we'll come back for Q&A. So I am going to um, share the screen just to get my slides. Let's see if this works. Here we go. OK. Um, right. So. Um, I wrote this book, which came out in 2017, called The Art of Losing Control. Um, and it was looking at the topic of ecstatic experiences. The first book I'd written was about ancient Greek philosophy and stoicism and how we can use that today. And this book was looking at the other side of, of, of really human experience, non-rational ecstatic experiences. Um, psychology and psychiatry doesn't talk that much about this type of experience. And when it does, it often uses different terminology for it. So sometimes psychologists and psychiatrists call this uh, mystical experiences or self-transcendent. Abraham Maslow called them peak experiences or my favorite term, ecstatic experiences. Sometimes psychologists use the phrase altered state of consciousness. Um, anthropologists prefer like to talk about trance states. Um, flow state, which is a kind of a scrubbed up, secular, well-behaved version of ecstasy that's popular in kind of coaching. Uh, and then anthropologists would also talk about spirit possession. And then psychiatrists, when they're pathologizing this type of experience, would talk about uh, this being really psychosis or schizophrenia or perhaps bipolar disorder. So I like the um, expression uh, ecstatic experience, which comes from the ancient Greek ecstasis which literally means standing outside yourself, your ordinary self. So an ecstatic experience is the moment where you go beyond your ordinary sense of self and reality and feel deeply connected to a power or intelligence or something greater than you. That can be euphoric or it can be terrifying. So it's not true that ecstasy means being very, very happy. An ecstatic experience can be very scary. It can be, um, you could have it alone or you could have a collective ecstatic experience. And you can interpret what you connect with in many different ways. You can interpret it as a connection to God or to a God or to universal consciousness or to a spirit or demon or to nature. That's what romantic poets talked about, like the sublime, or perhaps to another person, an ecstatic connection in love or to a group of people like at a rally or a festival or to your own higher self. In other words, it's not necessarily theistic or supernatural. People interpret this experience in different ways. So most cultures uh, at most times in history have had ecstatic rituals for healing, for meaning, for connection and for fun as ways to go get out of our heads. Uh, it was Aldous Huxley who said humans have a basic urge to self-transcendence. And every culture has to find a way to give people access out of their heads, give them avenues towards ecstatic experiences. But what's happened in the West, if you look at the history of ecstatic experience, is there's been a centuries long um, ideological war over the nature of mystical and ecstatic experiences. 
where since um, at least the 17th century and the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, materialist philosophers and psychologists and psychiatrists have defined ecstasy as a mental illness. So this lady was a patient at a French asylum called Salpetriere Clinic in Paris in the late 19th century. She was a patient of the pioneering neurologist Jean-Martin Charcot. And Charcot, along with many other kind of um, psychiatrists in the 19th century said, um, ecstasy is a form of brain disorder. He said it was just a symptom of a brain disorder called hysteria. Um, and um, this was, uh, and that basically if you have a spiritual ecstatic experience, this is proof that you're degenerate, a kind of evolutionary throwback, that you're unfit for society and you should be medicated and locked up. So if you have a spiritual experience, you should keep quiet about it and not tell other people. This was part of an ideological struggle between materialist um, psychiatry and the church, by the way, over who gets to take care of the human soul. But on the other side, at the margins of Western culture, you had um, ecstatic Christian groups like say Pentecostalists, and you had new age culture saying that ecstasy was not primitive and regressive and pathological, but actually the supreme experience of human existence, the best thing that could possibly happen to you. And if you have an ecstatic experience, that's proof that you are elect, chosen by God, superior to the rest of humanity in your maturity uh, and realization that you are at the vanguard of spiritual evolution. So you can see there's quite a dichotomy going on. Either an ecstatic experience is, is wholly bad and pathological, or an ecstatic experience is totally good and wonderful and light and joyous. Is there any room for a middle ground in how we see ecstatic experiences? Can we see them as both sometimes wonderful and healing and leading to flourishing, but also sometimes messy and scary and, and possibly damaging? Some psychologists and thinkers did try to find this middle ground. For example, William James, in his, what's still the best book on this topic to my mind, The Varieties of Religious Experience in 1902, and his friend and colleague, Frederick Myers, who's less well known, but he was the co-founder of the Society for Psychical Research at the end of the 19th century. And Myers and James developed a theory of the self and of ecstatic experiences. They were in a way the fathers of transpersonal psychology, which is kind of a niche field of psychology, which tries to find a positive place for mystical or ecstatic experiences unlike most psychologies which just ignore this type of experience or pathologize it. They came up with a model of the psyche. Myers was the, wrote the first paper about the subliminal self in I believe something like 1892, before Freud, before Jung and so on. He said that the ordinary everyday ego is just a kind of construction, a fiction, and that there's a much bigger subliminal self, which is just below the threshold, that's what subliminal means, below the threshold of ordinary consciousness. And that in this subliminal self, there are hidden potentialities. Myers said the subliminal self is both a rubbish dump and a treasure trove. So Freud, for example, said, you know, the id is mainly a rubbish dump, it's mainly full of primitive kind of impulses. Myers says, yes, there is kind of, uh, you know, uh, rubbish there. There is detritus. There is a tendency to illogical thinking. Um, and sometimes that's dangerous. But it's also a treasure trove, he said. There are hidden potentialities in the subliminal mind. Potentiality of, uh, of intelligence, of memory, of uh, wisdom, of learning, of healing. What we today call the placebo response is really a kind of hidden potentiality of healing in our subliminal mind. He also thought that possibly things like telepathy could be accessed when we access the subliminal mind in, in trance states. They were very interested in seances and mediums in the end of the 19th century. And they also thought that possibly if we access some kind of divine or spirit world, we do it through the subliminal self when we go into kind of subliminal or altered states of consciousness. So according to Myers and James's theory then, 
An ecstatic experience is what Myers called an uprush from the subliminal mind, a sudden release of normally subconscious and repressed energy, archetypal material. And this kind of uh, uprush creates a possibility for reconfiguration of the self. That's what William James was so interested in, the way people could experience these kind of rebirth moments in ecstatic states like psychedelic trips, for example, or conversion experiences. You know, they, have a, they go into a profound altered state and they feel themselves able to step out of their old selves into a new self. But ecstatic experiences can also mean the release of shadow material, that's a Jungian expression, like repressed trauma that you've buried uh, away from your ordinary everyday self. And ecstatic experiences also involve the disabling of your critical thinking faculties, which can make you prone to mythical thinking, them, us thinking, um, and very easily suggestible cult-like thinking as well. So there are some kind of dangerous gases, as it were, that get released in ecstatic experiences. So Myers and James suggested that the genius, one way to think about geniuses like John Nash say, is that they have unusual access to the hidden potentialities of their subliminal mind. And that gives them unusual powers of say creativity or thinking or wisdom, but it also can make them more prone to unusual illogical disordered uh, or pathological thinking. Um, so really a genius is someone who is access to the subliminal mind and all that power, but also quite a powerful conscious ego and quite a powerful pa uh, capacity of discrimination. So they can sort the good from the bad as it pours out from their subliminal mind. Now, since the 1960s, there's obviously been a re-evaluation of ecstatic experiences, an explosion of ecstatic practices back into Western culture. They've become much less pathologized, and we've got much more eager to, to have some, uh, you know, some of these experiences. And we can see data that shows that. So this is a survey from Gallup, which just asks people, have you ever had a religious or mystical experience? in America, and the number of people who've said they've had one or more has gone up from 20% uh, in the start of the 1960s to around 50% uh, 10 years ago in 2009. So more and more people are having mystical experiences apparently. There's a kind of mysticism for the masses. And I imagine that figure has just gone up in the last 10 years of the psychedelic renaissance where uh, seven years ago, over 30 million people in America said they were regular um, psychedelic users. So more and more people are having mystical experiences. But the question I'm interested in, as we as a culture more and more seek these kinds of experiences, is are, do we have the cultural tools to help people have these very you know, unusual and sometimes risky experiences? What if people aren't prepared to go beyond their habitual ego and don't know how to come back to consensual reality? Um, you think about, you know, mystical experiences in the past were often happened to, to monks or nuns in monasteries or nunneries, uh, training, uh, devoting their whole life to trying to go beyond their ego. Now people are having these experiences. Do they go to a festival one weekend? They pop LSD. Suddenly they're having a full-blown self-transcended experience, which they weren't expecting and they don't really have the training for. And then on Monday morning, they have to go back to their job as a, an accountant or whatever. So this is obviously quite uh, challenging. Uh, we've been sold the idea that spiritual experiences are always totally wonderful purely happy, light, angels, and so on. Because, you know, um, we've been pushing back against the pathologization of mystical So new age culture says, spiritual experiences are always wonderful. They're always great. You should seek them. They're amazing. When in fact, this is uh, more what they're like uh, down below. They, they, at least they can be quite disturbing uh, and sometimes quite scary. Uh, Joseph Campbell said, the psychotic drowns in the same waters in which the mystic swims with delight. So we're going into this kind of, you know, temporary psychotic stage sometimes uh, when we are going into altered states of consciousness. And some psychologists over the years have tried to look at these kinds of more messy 
or scary types of mystical experiences, which are difficult to integrate. Like um, Roberto Asagioli, he was the founder of um, psychosynthesis, as I'm sure many of you know. He wrote in a paper in 1937, um, the incidence of disturbances having a spiritual origin is rapidly increasing nowadays in step with the growing number of people who consciously or unconsciously are groping their way to a fuller life. Um, quite recently, uh, in 1989, uh, Christina Groff and her husband Stanislav Groff, two transpersonal psychologists, brought out this anthology of essays um, and they coined the phrase spiritual emergency. It's a brilliant anthology of essays, by the way, on this topic. And they wrote, um, they tried to define the spiritual emergency as something a bit different to ordinary psychosis. He said many individuals experiencing episodes of non-ordinary states of consciousness accompanied by various emotional, perceptual and psychosomatic manifestations are undergoing an evolutionary crisis rather than suffering from a mental disease. So they try to draw this distinction between mental illness and these kind of spiritual emergencies which I think is possibly problematic, but uh, let's, let, we'll come back to that. They said, if properly understood and treated as difficult stages in a natural developmental process, these experiences, these spiritual emergencies or transpersonal crises can result in emotional and psychosomatic healing, creative problem solving, personality transformation and conscious evolution. So what they're saying is we shouldn't treat um, these kinds of messy spiritual emergencies, which can involve extended alterations in, in your sense of self and reality for a, for a you know, fair amount of time. We shouldn't treat them as purely brain disorders, as just as, as breakdowns, that if they're properly navigated, they can be transitions to greater wholeness and greater maturity. Uh, and I think that's true. And I think that might be true of many types of uh, psychotic experience. Um, so my own spiritual emergency, I became interested particularly in this topic. I wrote about it a little in um, The Art of Losing Control. Um, then um, afterwards, after I published that book, I, I decided to go and try psychedelics for myself for the first time in um, 20 years after I'd had a bad trip when I was 18. I'd left them well clear. But in doing all this research on uh, psychedelic therapy, I was, I thought it was maybe time to go to kind of try them again, but in a proper guided uh, context. So I, and I was also interested in spiritual tourism, the way Westerners, if they're seeking ecstatic experiences, sometimes feel like they have to go abroad to other cultures in search of, of kind of spiritual or ecstatic experience. So I ended up um, going to the Amazon to uh, a, a kind of uh, an indigenous Shipibo Indian ayahuasca uh, retreat uh, to drink ayahuasca, um, and the actual retreat was was kind of fascinating and uh, and and very interesting and, and positive. Um, what happened then is in the days afterwards, um, I went to the I, I, I went on to the Galapagos Islands. Um, and when I was there, this was, um, I suppose, two days after the retreat, I went into quite a dissociated space where I started to think I, I'm not in ordinary reality. My kind of um, ability to um, uh, think critically was quite disabled. So rather than thinking you're not in an alternate reality, you're just still high after an ayahuasca retreat, I came to the conclusion, I was on my own, of course, I think I'm in a kind of dream or possibly I'm in some kind of bardo or afterlife state and that somehow this is all of my uh, kind of constructing so it was really a kind of I wasn't freaking out but I did I didn't really trust the reality of the reality I was in um, that lasted a few days and then a friend said uh, you know I think you better come home you don't say you sound pretty dissociated um, so then I had to come all the way back to London I had to take three flights back from London uh, back from the Galapagos, all the time thinking I was in a dream. Um, because I was in a dream, I thought, well, I might as well upgrade to first class on the plane because, you know, uh, money's, uh, this is all a figment of my imagination. Uh, so I did. It, it, sadly, it turned out not to be a dream as when I got my bill, uh, credit card bill, a few, a few weeks later. But I remember landing finally in London and a friend meeting me at the airport. And it reminded me of like the, that scene in Inception where he comes out into the airport and sees his family and he doesn't know if it's a dream or a rea or reality, but he decides to go with it. 
it was like that. I wasn't, still wasn't sure if my friend was uh, real or not, but I decided to go with it. So my friend and, and other friends, luckily they were familiar with this kind of experience. So they didn't just rush me to a psychiatric ward. They kind of gave me love and care uh, and lots of hugs. And after a few days, I, I came back to this reality. I came grounded back in this reality and I was fine. Um, so obviously I was quite, one thing that was quite interesting, by the way, during that experience is that I found my critical thinking ability was quite disabled. I found it difficult to understand conversations, to watch films, to read books. It was very difficult to make sense to me. But I, I borrowed this book from someone and uh, by Pema Chodron, who's a Buddhist nun. This book made perfect sense to me all the way through. Uh, that kind of wisdom really worked for me. So I found that these kinds of basic wisdom teachings worked even in very liminal states of consciousness, which was interesting to me. So after that, um, I became obviously more interested in spiritual emergencies. Um, I organized an event where several people talked about their own spiritual emergencies. And out of that, I and some of the speakers um, helped to put this book together, uh, which came out last month, which is basically 14 people's stories of their spiritual emergencies and what helped them through. My co-editor was Tim Reed, who is a psychiatrist. He's the consultant psychiatrist at Imperial College's Psychedelics Lab. Um, and he um, he's a kind of transpersonal psychiatrist. He's, that, he's a psychiatrist who's open to positive spiritual experiences. And we try to be agnostic about what spiritual experiences mean in the sense of what you connect to, whether it's to God or the spirit world and so on. We were agnostic about that. We let our contributors make up their own minds about that. But we asked them what caused this experience, what was it like, and what helped. So it was very much a pragmatic viewpoint. What helped you through? So what caused it? Well, of course, we can't really talk about genetic factors. We didn't have the data for that, but there could be some genetic factors. For example, a predisposition to dissociation or schizotypy. Uh, schizotypy is basically a theoretical concept which suggests there's a continuum of personality um, experiences, uh, of, of being prone to unusual experiences, ranging from normal dissociative imaginative states, like being having capacity for flow, for example, or for creative trance states, all the way to extreme states of mind related to psychosis. And they, that, that basically there's a continuum of, that, of those kinds of states of mind through the general population. Um, we did see in several of our contributors that they'd had um, childhood trauma uh, and trauma or in their teenage times. So perhaps trauma makes people more prone to having messy spiritual experiences when, for example, they take psychedelics or go to spiritual retreats because they have perhaps kind of buried trauma and they go beyond their ordinary self and some of this shadow stuff or this buried trauma comes out and makes them more likely to have a difficult experience, which doesn't mean it's a bad experience because sometimes that could be the trauma demanding the person's attention. Uh, demanding that this is an opportunity for integration. In terms of the short-term trigger for the crises, what we saw in, in, our, in our case studies or in these stories, uh, for some people it was psychedelic drugs. Um, for some people, uh, the emergency was triggered by intense spiritual exercises, for example, going on a retreat. Um, for some people, it was triggered by grief, um, the loss of a significant other or a very bad breakup. Um, we noticed that for me and for others, um, they often happen when people were abroad uh, and, uh, or away from their usual support network, and that made them more prone to getting into difficulties. Of course, you know, it's through our, our friends and loved ones that we kind of stay grounded and stay in touch with, with, with each other and can, can reality check. And in, in one um, story in the book, um, their spiritual crisis was triggered by a political crisis, by Brexit. So they had a kind of Brexit triggered um, psychosis, uh, which is interesting in terms of this crisis, the pandemic. I suspect that the pandemic is also probably triggering certain individual uh, spiritual crises as well. And there might also, of course, be a supernatural cause. 
it's possible that something, uh, you know, God or something in the spirit world was seeking out these people. At least that's how some of our contributors made sense of these experiences. That this wasn't just a personal experience in their head, it was also an encounter with a greater reality. Uh, we as the editors remained agnostic about that. What is the experience like? Well, what happens is there's a buildup of kind of tension within this context, whether that's on a trip or, or on a retreat, and then there's suddenly a flip into another state of consciousness and the person stays in that altered state of consciousness. Um, time slows down, the person's attention is deeply absorbed in the moment. Things take on a heightened, numinous uh, significance. There's a, an overlap of the inner and outer world. It's like the dream camera and the, and the ordinary camera become overlapped, superimposed on each other. So dream, archetypal and mythical material spills out into everyday life. You're dreaming with your eyes open, as it were. Um, people notice synchronicities, signs, patterns, hidden meanings, uncanny coincidences. Uh, and the person may see themselves as some kind of cosmic archetype. So some of our contributors saw themselves as Jesus or Eve or Ishtar. Um, so there's this kind of, uh, you know, these archetypes are always there in our dreams, but this, a person can become possessed by these archetypes, by which I mean they completely lose any distance. They completely identify with this um, archetype. So one of our, our contributors, John Ablett, decided um, he is enlightened uh, and he became a, a spiritual teacher when he was 21. He, was, he became, got the nickname the Barefoot Guru uh, and people followed him uh, for, for days and weeks. Even his university lecturers started to kind of pay him all this great respect. So he kind of was on his way to becoming a guru. And then he suddenly kind of came down a bit, came off that high and thought, oh, I'm, I'm not enlightened and I think I'm just playing a role now. And he had the kind of courage to leave that guru role and go back to his family and go back to his kind of, you know, young adult life, which took a lot of guts. I wonder how many gurus have that kind of come down from that high, but get stuck in the role and then get into all kinds of problems. There's often a feeling of unreality, of ego dissolution, a feeling that you might have died or you're in some kind of apocalypse or end times a feeling of ontological uncertainty. This is definitely what it was like for me. Is this real? Is this a dream? Am I constructing this? Am I God in that case? Or am I dead? It was a bit like the Truman Show in that respect, which I think is quite common for kind of psychotic experiences. Um, and I, I was interested after my experience to see that th this is quite common to have that feeling that I had, that you're, you're either in a dream or dead. Uh, so John Weir Perry, who was a pioneering uh, psychologist in the 70s, who ran a, a, a retreat center for people with, recovering from spiritual emergencies, he said, uh, whenever a profound experience of change is about to take place, the harbinger is the motif of death. In severe visionary states, one feels one has crossed into the realm of the dead and is living among the spirits of the deceased. That's exactly what it was like for me. When I was on a ferry going off the Galapagos Islands, I thought, uh, this must be sticks. This must be Charon ferrying me across uh, the dead. This is one of our contributors, Deborah Martin. She took MDMA at a club in Glasgow. She said, the morning after the club, I woke to a world that looked entirely different. Everything in the room, the clothes, the walls, the chest of drawers, seemed strangely insubstantial, as if woven from air. Otherness, the otherness of objects, the otherness of people, was just an illusion. So she'd gone into a kind of Buddhist state of the interconnectedness of all things, but she didn't want to, and it was terrifying. I wanted those illusions back. I was tortured by the fear that this perceptual shift was going to result in the entire world disappearing before my eyes. So this is an involuntary mystical experience which she wasn't prepared for or trained for and didn't have the support to, to, to cope with. And in a way, the insight has some truth in it. Reality is a controlled hallucination. Uh, if you watched Anil Seth's TED talk, he's a, um, a neuroscientist. He, he says reality is a controlled hallucination, a set of habitual expectations based around a fictional hero, i.e. the ordinary self. But it's not just your hallucination. That's when you can get into trouble, thinking this is all just my imagining rather than a collective hallucination. There can also be a powerful sense of interconnectedness to the universe, which can be euphoric and ego inflating. I am God, I am controlling everything. Or it can be terrifying and paranoid. They can read my mind, they're out to get me. 
The raw self stripped of its usual armor feels acutely sensitive, isolated and alienated from others. There can be strained relationships, breakups and bruising, bruising encounters with experts, either health experts, psychiatrists or religious experts who offer glib and reductionist explanations. So what helped our contributors through? Um, we'd looked at kind of set setting and integration, which is a kind of an idea that's come from psychedelic therapy, of course. Setting, um, a sympathetic, calm, non-judgmental setting helps the mind settle, uh, the mind and body slow down and stabilize. So in my case, for example, just having friends who are non-judgmental, who weren't freaked out and who could just give me support uh, and, and love. Human connection, love and touch hugs um, helps bring the mind back from its flight to transcendence. Uh, maps and guides can also help us find our way back. Uh, books, friends, therapists, support groups like the Spiritual Crisis Network or Emerging Crowd. I, I'll, I'll tell you more about support groups at the end. Uh, and sometimes um, drugs can help take the edge off as well. Tranquilizers may help when we're in acute anxiety. But of course, psychiatric wards are not always the best setting if you're trying to slow your mind down when it's in a really heightened uh, kind of mystical state. It can be easy to flip into a into kind of paranoid state. And what about the mindset? Well, all our contributors managed to find a positive frame of meaning and growth for these difficult experiences, rather than just a pathological frame of breakdown and disease. So the frame on which they managed to take their experience was really important. It reminds me of the Stoic quote from Epictetus, what disturbs people is not events, but their opinion about events. It's not so much these weird experiences, it's the frame you have of them that decides whether it's healthy or not. Um, a lot of our contributors said that mindfulness practices to connect to their body, their breath and their senses really helped them. Again, because they'd gone into dissociated states where they'd left ordinary material reality. So it was really helpful to kind of ground back with their body and their breath and, and this material reality. Um, an attitude of acceptance helped, reminding ourselves this will pass. That was very helpful for me. And having compassion for yourself, even when you're you know, in a completely altered reality. Um, an attitude of humility um, helped some of our contributors, avoiding what Ram Das called the trap of specialness. If you have an ecstatic experience and you think, I'm special, I am unique, this happened to me, I am one of the elect, that can easily lead to ego inflation and grandiosity. And that can easily flip into persecution. If I am the Messiah, then maybe there are others out to get me. Um, so humility, staying grounded, just because you have a, you know, a fragment of, of the logos or God within you doesn't mean that you alone are God. Um, so we can, you know, trying to identify with these cosmic archetypes without becoming possessed by them. What um, Alan Watts called no fuss spirituality. And um, finally, discernment. Am I perhaps taking a dream metaphor over literally? Um, this, for example, a man took ayahuasca and got a message that he should construct a wooden pyramid to communicate with aliens. It's possible he was taking some kind of mythical message from his subconscious over literally, uh, over fundamentalist interpretation of it. And that can happen quite a lot. Um, so uh, integration, well, I, I'm, uh, I could say a lot more about it, but I want to put you into breakout rooms. But and briefly, many of our contributors had a first crisis for which they were unprepared, which was traumatic. Then after a period of training, they had a second crisis, which they're able to handle, which reminds me a bit of Luke Skywalker, how he got his, his kind of butt kicked by Darth Vader uh, in, in uh, Empire Strikes Back. But then he has a period of training and is able to face his shadow with mindfulness, compassion and non-reactivity. And the second crisis helps um, our participants to feel more comfortable in both worlds, the mundane and the spiritual. Uh, many of them now identify with the archetype of the wounded healer. They're able to draw on their experience to help others. So unresolved questions, which um, I'd like you to consider. Is spiritual emergency the right phrase or is it spiritual? Does that confine it just to kind of new age culture? Can one, as the Groff said, draw a clean line between spiritual emergency and ordinary psychosis? Can you say, oh, these people are having this kind of good experience, which is called spiritual emergency, which has nothing to do with like ordinary psychosis? 
or do all psychotic experiences have some aspects of the spiritual to them? And all spiritual experiences have some aspect of the you know, unusual or the, or the psychotic. Um, I think the same tools that work with spiritual emergency work with ordinary psychosis as well. Um, can we be comfortable with the ambiguity that sometimes it's not clear whether this, this kind of, um, you know, experience you're having is the, uh, an evolutionary growth thing or it's just messy and a, and a breakdown. We don't really know. We just got to kind of work through it. The map is not always clear. Um, our contributors, we put out these adverts saying, please, please send us in your um, contributions. All our contributors were white and middle class. Well, what does that mean? How do other cultures define this sort of experience? Is this culture bound? You know, a lot of this is about having the power to define your own experience and say, this isn't a breakdown. This is possibly something positive and meaningful. Well, who has the power to say that? And why are some people denied that power to find meaning in their experience and to find something positive? And then you're looking at economic uh, issues and uh, issues of, of racial inequality and so on in terms of who gets to define their experience. How do we get this information out there? Um, I'll talk at the end about um, some of the, the groups that are working in this space and really getting information out there. And finally, why now? How is it connected to macro factors? We could say the present is something like a collective spiritual emergency. We're in a meltdown of the habitual, in the uprush of the repressed, creating both pain and also the possibility for reconfiguration, a moment of intense species connection. Can we accept ambiguity, that it's not clear what will emerge, but we can try and stay grounded and contribute positively and mindfully while accepting our difficult emotions and the limit of our control? Accepting ambiguity, that a difficult situation can be both painful and beautiful. They don't have to be just one or the other. Um, these tools certainly help, tools like mindfulness, compassion, equanimity, non-reactivity, remembering it will pass, trying to stay grounded in our body and trying to practice discernment as all this mythical uh, material floods out of our collective subconscious. Is this definitely true? Is this wise? And so on. Thank you, Jules. That's fantastic. <laughs> sure. Nice to see you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Jules. Thank you. I really enjoyed that. Thank you.